And it's a pleasure to introduce Dimitri Zvonkin, who will uh, give us a talk titled Plugging Alice equal to zero in the space of our schools. <coughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, I wrote my title. <laughs> Okay, so, so some of you have actually already heard uh, some version of this talk. I was tempted to say something new, but it was a little bit too far removed from the topic of the conference. So I think it's better if I give an updated version of, of this. So the talk is about uh, the cohomology of the moduli space uh, MGN bar of stable, stable curves. So I made a picture here. <laughs> so this is NGN bar. It parameterizes all uh, all curves of genus G with n marked points. So here I do genus 2 and 3 marked points. And if you take a random point like that, you will get a smooth smooth curve, so a Riemann surface with 3 marked points. And then, uh, because you want to have a compact space, the bar means compactification, you add some more points that form a normal crossing divisor in MGN bar, which parameterize curves with uh, simple self-intersections, nodes like that. So here you have curves with one node, when you have a self-intersection of this divisor, you have two nodes, and if I had a three-dimensional blackboard, I could draw curves with <coughs> three nodes and so on. Okay, so the problem will be today to find uh, the cohomology class compared dual to three special cycles in this uh, moduli space. So there will be three, uh, three problems that I will call A, B, and C. Maybe I will draw each one in a different place. So the first one is the holomorphic locus. So let's take uh, n integers, a1, a n, greater than or equal to 0, uh, that sum up to 2g minus 2. Then I can look at the locus of curves with n marked points. So let's start with smooth curves. smooth curves with n marked points such that so there are many ways to say it. One way to say it is that there exists a holomorphic one form with zeros exactly at points x1, xn and the orders of zeros are exactly 1, a, n. Or I can say that the canonical divisor twisted by minus sum of a i, x i is trivial, is a, is a principal divisor, is the same as O. Oh. Or I could say that the divisor, that the canonical divisor omega is uh, equivalent to the divisor sum of the i, x, i. So you choose the way you prefer. There exists a holomorphic one form with zeros at the x, i's of orders, <coughs> orders a1, a n. There exists a holomorphic one form with zeros at x i's of orders a i. Okay, so this is a locus inside this is a locus inside MGN without the bar because I only talked about the smooth curves. But now I can simply take its closure and this is a locus in MGN bar. So let me give you the simplest example. Example. The simplest example is uh, I take g equals 2, n equals 1, and a1 equals 2. So I'm looking to, I'm looking for uh, curves, genus two curves with one marked point 
such that uh, there is a holomorphic conform with a double zero at this marked point. Right? So this is the locus of Cx, C of genus 2, such that x is a virus stress point. Okay, so I call this <coughs> I call this the Weierstrass stress locus. And that's the simplest example of the polymorphic locus. In general, maybe I should. <coughs> so in general, when you have a when you have a genus two surface. It is always hyperelliptic, so it can always be projected to, to the projective line, and it has six ramification points, <coughs> the virus stress points of this uh, genus 2 curve. <coughs> so that's co-dimension 1 in M21 bar. Right, if you take uh, these points, form a co-dimension 1 locus in this curve, so in M21 bar, that's co-dimension 1. In general, this is the dimension <coughs> g minus 1. I will explain why in a moment. Can you explain again why this yeah. is a special case? I don't know if you want to finish this point. Is it going to be So actually, uh, how do you prove that the genus 2 curve is always hyperelliptic? You take the space of homomorphic one forms. It's a two-dimensional vector space. And this map goes to the projectivization of its dual. So if you want, if you take two holomorphic one forms, you write alpha over beta, and this is this map. Right? And so two conjugate points that are zeros of a holomorphic differential. So if you pick a point here, there's always exactly one holomorphic differential with two zeros like that. And if it has a double preimages, the holomorphic differential has a double zero. So these are exactly the points where Homomorphic differential can have a double zero. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, question number B is the same. Well, it's exactly the same, except that now I take integers ai, and I suppose that at least one ai is negative. And then I can ask exactly the same question. So again, I suppose that some of the, the AI sum up to 2g minus 2. And I would like, uh, so I would like to, to take the locus, to take the locus of curves such that this divisor is principal. So now that means that there exists a meromorphic one form. Right? There exists a meromorphic one form with zeros and poles only at the marked points. With zeros and poles at the X i's, and again the orders are given by the AIs. The positive AIs correspond to zeros, and the negative AIs correspond to poles. So it looks like a very similar locus, but actually this one is called dimension G. Uh, so let me explain why. Uh, this G is actually easier to explain than the G minus one, the G minus one. So in general, when you when you have some fixed uh, some fixed divisor, it's a point of the Jacobian of the curve. The Jacobian of the curve has dimension has dimension g. So now, if you take a random divisor like that, it's another point in the Jacobian. So the condition that these two points coincide normally it's a, it's a condition of dimension g. And normally, if you if you if you put here any, any line bundle, you will get co-dimension G. And this case is special because uh, 
Well, there's the space of holomorphic one forms has dimension one more than expected. Holomorphic one forms, this, this, this line bundle has an H1. So you see the Weierstrass points there, they form a <coughs> locus of codimension one instead of codimension two. Okay, so I'm not completely finished yet. Maybe let, let, me, let me do, let me do the, the, the next question. So the next question is uh, very similar. So again, you have a1, an in z. It may have been more logical to start with this because it <coughs> looks, uh, uh, looks like the, the simplest case. Now the ai sum, sum up to zero. And so now I'm looking for the curves where this divisor is principal. In other words, there exists a meromorphic function, meromorphic function, again with zeros and poles, zeros and poles. At x1, x1, xn of orders a1an. Okay, <clears throat> so now I have to confess so wh why I started with problem A instead of problem C. Uh, so the, the reason is that for the holomorphic locus, the right thing is just to take the locus in MGN and take the closure. In these two cases, it is not true. So it is more natural to take the <coughs> to take a slightly extended locus. Now let me let me give you an example to show why. Here's a joint example. So let's take the example in genus one. That's an example both for B and for C, because in genus one the cotangent line bundle to, to an elliptic curve is trivial. So asking for a function with given zeros and poles or for a meromorphic one form of zeros and poles is the same. OK, so genus 1, I will take two marked points. A1 equals 2, and A2 equals minus 2. Right, so I have an elliptic curve, two marked points, and I am looking for uh, so I'm asking for the existence of a function with a double zero at one point and a double pole at the other point. Okay, so that means that x1 minus x2 is a two-torsion element, two-torsion element in the elliptic curve. Right? This is the this is the meromorphic locus in this case. And now you can see the catch because a two torsion could mean that x1 and x2 are the same point. So for stable curves, that would mean that they bubbled out on a rational component. If you look at curves like that, it's also reasonable to say that there exists a meromorphic function. Indeed, there exists a meromorphic function with a double zero at one point and a double pole at another point. This meromorphic function is constant on this elliptic, on this elliptic curve, right? Uh, so it's uh, very natural to include this into the locus, but it is not in the closure of this one. You cannot deform that into a, into a meromorphic function in a smooth elliptic curve. Right. So, so unfortunately, the meromorphic locus is equal to the closure of this plus plus some explicit low side in the boundary. And I hope that this example convinces you that it is natural to add this low side. At least in this example, 
you can see that it is much more natural to give the condition that x1 minus x2 is a 2 is a 2 torsion element than the condition that x1 minus x2 is a 2 torsion element but not 0. And here it's even worse. So here it's called the double ramification cycle because a meromorphic function with given zeros and poles has given ramifications over zero and infinity. And in this case, it's again the closure of this plus some loci in the boundary. But I cannot even write the word explicit. <laughs> because here, so this cycle is actually constructed constructed using the virtual fundamental class. So that means that you take uh, the space of stable maps instead of just taking meromorphic functions, you first take a space of stable maps with given branching conditions over zero and infinity. This space of stable maps has many, have many, has many components of different dimensions and there's a special procedure to construct uh, what is called the virtual fundamental class. So a class of uh, the expected dimension, in this case again, the dimension G, supported on this, supported on this space of stable maps. So here, the, if you actually try it, if you actually want to formulate the problem precisely, you have some work to do. Okay. So it's the the same coordination? Yes. It's a pure dimension cycle. <coughs> per dimension G minus 1, per dimension G, per dimension G. So if you view it as Poincaré dual cohomology class, this will be a cohomology class of degree G minus 1, degree G, degree G. So now we have our problem, let's try to solve it. <coughs> let's try to solve, so first, first let's try to solve B and C, and then A. Oh, what is the question? Yeah. Oh, the solve. question is, yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, find these cohomology classes. Um, yeah, so maybe I should <coughs> write that down or say it's more like a in a more solid way. So the, the problem is what are the cohomology classes? How do you compute the cohomology classes represented by these three cycles? So you want to express them in terms of Yeah, okay, that's a, okay, that's a question I was trying to avoid, but it's, uh, of course <laughs> <laughs> of course it's uh, yeah. <coughs> in terms of what? So look at this picture again, it's still like it's still here. So in MG and Boy you have some uh, very natural uh, you, you have this boundary, boundary, boundary classes, right? Boundary strata, boundary divisors, and their intersections. Each of them represents a cohomology class <coughs> by Poincaré duality. So this already gives you a collection of classes. This is still not uh, completely enough, but if you allow to take self-intersections of these boundary divisors and their push forwards you get a bigger set of, uh, of generators on which a lot is known. So <coughs> these generators, it, it is known how to multiply them, how to compute their intersection numbers. Is it tautological? Yeah, it's a tautological ring of MGN bar. Okay, so, okay. <coughs> so, I should get. so, so the claim is, uh, let me see, yeah, it's all proved. So the claim is all these, these three cycles lie in the tautological ring of MGN bar. So it can be expressed from the <coughs> their usual generators. And these generators are the boundary divisors, their intersections and push forwards. So <coughs> if I had to introduce the set of generators that would take me maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and I decided to skip <coughs> this step because I, I never used them in the talk in the, in the end. So it's a <coughs> 
But of course, uh, the question yeah, in terms of what is, uh, comes to the mind, yeah, all right. <coughs> okay. Uh, so, let, so let's try to solve the problems uh, B and C where the codimension is G. So the codimension G is a little bit easier. Okay, so let me denote this uh, line bundle by L. In one case it's uh, O twisted uh, by the marked points, and in the other case it's omega twisted by the mark points. And I would like to find the locus. So the locus I'm looking for is the locus where L is uh, L is the trivial line bundle. <coughs> so on every, on every curve I have this line bundle. It's degree zero. And I'm looking for the locus when it's not just degree zero, but actually trivial. Um, so let's uh, so let's first look at the MGN bar minus the locus. So over this, over this, we have H zero CL equal to zero, and H one CL. So is a rank G minus one vector bundle. <laughs> right? If L is not the trivial line bundle, that means that it has no sections. H zero C L is equal to zero. Uh, so it's H one has the dimension given by the Riemann-Roch formula. In this case, G minus one. And if you have these vector bundles that are all of the same dimension, they form a vector bundle of rank G minus 1. Right? So I have, I have my MGN bar. If I take out the locus I'm looking for, outside I have this simple picture. OK. Uh, so that means in particular that if I write the G churn class of, yeah, so. Um, so maybe I, I, I'll use the, the proper notation. So th this vector bundle is actually called R1 uh, by star of L. So pi is uh, the <coughs> F feature symmetric. So all this is called the universal curve. And this projection is called the universal family that's called phi. <coughs> so now when I have a line bundle L over the universal curve, I can take its push forward. And there are these two sheaves, R0 by star L and R1 by star L, which are composed uh, uh, Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, if you take to, if you take one point here, over one point to have a curve and a line bundle over the curve, and this line bundle has an H zero and an H one. When you have a family, you can glue these H zeros and H ones into two sheaves called R zero by star L and <coughs> R one by star L. Okay. So if I take R one by star L. And then I'm actually going to subtract R0 by star L for a reason I will explain in a moment. So over, over this locus, if I, if I take away the locus uh, where L is, uh, L is trivial, this is equal to 0. Because on this locus, this, is just, this just vanishes. This is a vector bundle of rank G minus 1. So if I take the churn class number G, it vanishes. Okay. So now if I do not restrict to this locus any, lo any longer, let's take this, no. let's, let's take this on all of MGN bar. Then it looks like a very good candidate for the answer. Because it's a codimension G locus, 
and it's supported exactly where I want it to be, exactly where, uh, right, uh, exactly where L is, where L has sections. Right, so it looks like uh, like a very plausible candidate for to to the answer. Looks good. Like a candidate. Okay. So as you will see in a moment, it's actually not the right answer. I will explain why. It's close, but it's not the right answer. And the uh, second part of my talk will be dedicated to the question how to correct this. But before I explain why this is not the right answer, <coughs> let me do this for the holomorphic locus. Uh, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so for yeah, for question A, because there is a there is a small subtlety. Where can I do that? Um, here. Try to do the same thing with question A and see how we get codimension G minus 1. So, same thing, you take omega equals, uh, sorry, L equals omega twisted by minus sum of the ISI. Uh, okay, now I have, uh, again, I have the space, so outside on, on MGN bar minus the holomorphic locus, I have H0 of Cl equals 0, H1 of Cl, so they form a vector, vector bundle R1 by star of L of rank G minus 1. Uh, but now I would like to have something of uh, degree G minus 1 instead of degree G. <clears throat> so I notice that, uh, okay, H1, so, uh, so let me see. So there is a, there is this natural map from H0 of C0 to H0 of uh, C sum of AI XI. Right, so this is the this is just uh, C <coughs> just constant uh, constants. <coughs> this is the space of functions with poles allowed at the marked points, but in particular the constant function is also inside here. Right? So this is just including constants inside functions with poles allowed at the points XI. So now if I take the duals of all of these spaces by the shared duality, I get H1 of C omega minus A, AI sum of AI XI. And here I get, well, here I still get C. The dual of C is still C. Let me just draw it like that. Right, so there is a natural map from H1, from this H1 to C. Right. And this means that uh, the top churn class of this vector bundle is equal to zero. So when you have uh, the top churn class, it's actually the same. Well, the top churn class are multiplicative. So when you have this, uh, when you have this, uh, this map here, you have some <coughs> kernel. Right. This is a surjective map. So the top churn class of this vector bundle is the product of the top churn class of this line bundle and the top churn class of the kernel. And the top term class here is equal to zero. Right. So the top term class of this uh, vector bundle is equal to zero. So even though the vector bundle is a frame g minus one, I can still take cg minus one of r one by star l minus r zero by star l, and I see that on mgn bar minus the holomorphic locus, this term class vanishes. vanishes on MGM bar minus the holomorphic locus. 
Yes. What does that mean exactly? <coughs> Which part? That a churn class vanishes on an open. The churn class is equal to the churn class is a cohomology class, and it's, uh, you can restrict it. So, uh, right. I see. So you pull it back yeah. using the inclusion. Yes. Yes. <coughs> you can see it as a as a differential form, for instance. I see. Right. <coughs> so once again, this looks like a very good candidate for the for the for the answer. It's something of the correct degree, and it vanishes exactly outside of this holomorphic locus, which is of dimension g minus one. So it would be very natural to assume that it represents the, the holomorphic locus. <coughs> so now I'm going to disappoint you. <coughs> I have to I have to erase. Start erasing the questions. Okay, so <clears throat> the disappointing part. So, I, why this is not the right answer? Why is g minus one of R1 by star L minus R0 by star L. So maybe before, before, okay, before, before me, before disappointing, uh, before saying it's the wrong answer, maybe I should, <coughs> I should write. So this is actually equal to the holomorphic locus restricted to MGM. <coughs> so my reasoning, even <coughs> although uh, a little bit naive was not so wrong. So there is a paper by Thumb and Porteous uh, who explained how to uh, how to develop this uh, this intuition actually into an actual proof. And uh, <coughs> if as long as you work with smooth curves, this can actually be transformed into an actual proof. And uh, this is a correct equality restricted to NGF, but not but not on NGF. <laughs> so let me show you why. This is the evil locus. So this is again the example genus 2, n equals 1, a1 equals 2. That's the example of the virus trust locus. And let's look uh, at this boundary divisor and n to one bar. <clears throat> so this boundary divisor is not in the closure of the Weierstrass locus simply because this is codimension one and the Weierstrass locus is also codimension one. So one cannot be in the closure of the other. But I claim that on this locus, uh, actually H0 CL is equal to 1. It's not equal to 0, so on this locus let me write it here. H0 of CL is equal to 1. Now remember, CL in this case is omega twisted by minus 2x. x is this marked point. So okay. we're looking for holomorphic one forms that vanish, that have a double 0 at x. And such holomorphic one forms do exist. So we take the holomorphic one form identically equal to zero in this component. Then it has a zero of any order at, at x, even a 100, one, zero for the 100 if you want to. And here we have a genus one component, and we still have a one dimensional space of holomorphic one forms on, on the zero one component. Right, so here we just have any. Holomorphic one, <coughs> holomorphic one form, right? And that's a section of L. Vanishes identically here. It does not vanish here. So it's a non-zero section of L. So there's a one-dimensional space of sections of L. So my lines and my line of reasoning uh, told you that uh, this thing vanishes whenever H zero is equal to zero. But on this device, H0 is not equal to 0. And actually, if you compute CG minus 1, so you're 
No. In this case, you get the correct equality that the Vash plus locus plus this evil boundary divisor is equal to the first term plus of R1 by star L minus R0 by star L. <clears throat> so in this case, this actually still allows you to compute the virus trust locus if you wish to use this method, because the right hand side can be <coughs> can be computed by the Grothendieck de Kriemann-Roch formula. I was thinking of doing an aside in the Grothendieck de Kriemann-Roch formula, but probably <coughs> probably I won't have time. But this can be computed. This is an explicit boundary divisor. If you subtract one from the other, you can get the wire trust locus. But it gets worse in higher genus. In higher genus, you get more and more of these evil boundary loci, and then they, uh, these loci start having dimension bigger than the dimension of the actual locus you're interested in, so you don't know what to do. So here's an idea to... to kill the, <coughs> the evil boundary loci. space of fourth roots of L, so here we thus come at the space of fourth roots that was in my title. So we are looking for a line bundle S whose rth tensor power is isomorphic to L. So L, in all of these constructions, L is a line bundle of degree zero. So if I draw the Jacobian of the curve, here somewhere I have L. Now I would like to find a line bundle S uh, whose path tensor power is equal to L. So let's take R equals 3, for instance. Then I have to, then I must divide this by 3, and this would be S. But that's not the only possibility. So the Jacobian is the, the quotient of uh, the vector space c to the power g by some lattice. And now I, if I shrink the lattice by a factor of r, all of these points are also, are also solutions. So altogether, there are r to the power 2g solutions for S. Okay, and so if you do this construction so that <coughs> there's a whole, again, the whole part that I skip, you can do this construction not only for smooth curves with nice Jacobians like that, there is a construction of how to extend the space of our roots to stable curves. So you get this space mg1 over r that depends on uh, L. So L here can be twisted omega or twisted canonical line bundle. And it has a projection to mgn bar that is a Ramified covering, ramified covering with R to the power 2G sheets. So 
So over the open part over MGN, it's actually non-ramified for any points in the smooth in MGN, you have exactly R to the power 2G solutions, but over the boundary it becomes ramified. Okay, so how is this going to help us? Example of the Weierstrass locus again. So here is M21 bar. <coughs> here is the Weierstrass locus. <coughs> and here is the evil boundary divisor. So these are the loci where my line bundle L has a section. Okay, <coughs> so now in this moduli space of earth roots, so I'll try to draw a picture, but it's going to take me some time because even, so g is equal to 2 here, so even if I take r equals 2, I have uh, 2 to the power 2g sheets, so that's 16 sheets. Right? 2, 3, 4, 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. <coughs> Normally, my, there's a one to one correspondence, so I don't have to count these. <laughs> Hopefully, there are also 16. Okay, and now let's look, uh, let's uh, ask ourself, ourselves when. Does S have a section? So over smooth curves, uh, yeah. First of all, so first of all, I say that there is a there is an implication. There is an implication that goes one way. That is always true. If H zero C S is non-zero, it implies that H0 CL is also non-zero. So if S has a section, I can just trace it to the earth power and get a section of L. Right? <coughs> now the question, so I know that if S has a section, it's only in this place. Over a point like that, S can never have a section, because L doesn't have a section. <laughs> However, the, in the other, the, other, okay, the other direction, the implication does not work. But let, let's look at a smooth curve at the beginning. So if I have a smooth curve, L has a section, that means that L is actually the trivial line bundle. Right? So the trivial line bundle has R to the power 2G different R roots, out of which exactly one is the trivial line bundle. And all others are R torsion points. Right? So there is... I'll draw this in yellow, so these are the lowest side with a section, <coughs> are going to be in yellow. So over the Weierstrass locus, there is exactly one copy of the Weierstrass locus where S has a section. And all these are uh, R torsion line bundles that are not trivial to them, they have no sections. So now let's look at the evil locus. It's get, it, it gets more interesting over the evil locus. So over the evil locus, you have these two components here. Okay. So you have this line bundle. It has a section on the. It has a section on this component. So here it's trivial. Here it also has a section, but actually the section is identically equal to zero. So when I take the north root, I will take an north root of the line bundle here and an north root of the line bundle here. I have four, four possibilities here and four possibilities here. Because this is genus 1 and this is genus 1. So 2 to the power 2g, that is 4. <coughs> okay, and here I must be careful to choose the trivial, the trivial, uh, the trivial north root. 
out of R squared, actually, by taking here the R squared possibilities here, R squared possibilities here. Here, only one of them will be the trivial R through the, <coughs> the, the trivial line bundle with a section. But here, I can, I can pick whatever I like. Because here, the section is identically equal to zero. There is always the R root of zero. Right. <coughs> so here, there will be R squared sheets such that S is trivial on this right hand side component and anything on the left hand side component. So now if I take, I should call this ramified cover something, so it's, uh, let's, <coughs> let's call this P. So let's take the locus where S has a section. H0 of S is not 0, and take the push forward of this. And now I have a, a new equality. So now this is, given, this is equal to the Weierstrass locus plus R squared times the evil locus. So you can compare, at least if you sit far away, you can compare this equality to the other equality. So here I have a formula for r equals 1. This formula is actually for the case r equals 1, where I didn't have any, any roots, I just take the well, first, <coughs> first root. Then I have this <coughs> locus where L has a section, which is the Weierstrass locus plus the evil locus. But now we generalize it to any r. And again, I have this, this thing that is equal to the right stress locus plus r squared times the even locus. So now I have me a means to separate the two terms by taking different r's. Okay, <coughs> so now I can formulate the theorems and conjectures. Let me do it in reverse. <coughs> okay, so for C I had uh, sum of the i is equal to 0, L is equal to O of minus sum of the i x i. And now I take the push forward of the G, so top term class, top term class of R1 pi star of S minus R0 pi star of S. So I do the same thing as I did with L, but instead I do it with S. I find some locus in this space of path roots where S has sections and then I project it to MG and bar. And so for technical reasons I have to multiply it by R. <coughs> you can't forget about it for now. So the first theorem is that theorem. So this thing is a polynomial in R for R big enough. Uh, so let me explain what that means. <coughs> this is an element of the cohomology space of MGM bar. Right? This is for every R, it's an element of the same vector space. So an element of a vector space can, can decompose it into any basis, and all these all the coordinates are polynomials in R. Right, this is what it means to be a, <coughs> a cohomology class that is a polynomial in R. It just means that it's a vector that depends polynomially on R. And now if I plug R equals 0 into this polynomial, 
I get the DR cycle. So the double ramification cycle, that's, that was my problem C for N1 and N. Do you mean that this is a true polynomial or that there is a polynomial growth of coefficients? No, it's, a, it's really a polynomial. Just so to you to plug, if you want to plug r equals zero, you have to. <coughs> this is an example of a polynomial like that, right? One cohomology plus plus r squared another mm -hmm. cohomology. And if I plug r equals zero, I find the homomorphic locus. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so b is the same. Sum of the i's is equal to 2g minus 2. L is now omega twisted by, well, twisted omega, it's, it's the meromorphic locus. So there exists a negative ai. So then the status of this is somewhat intermediate. Again, exactly the same way R times the push forward of this G, the top charge bus R1 by star S minus R0 by star S uh, is a polynomial in R. It's exactly the same statement. Is a polynomial in R for R big enough? Uh, however, now. to give myself more space. Uh, however, now, so I don't, so well, let me write this as a conjecture. So maybe let's write this as a conjecture. Conjecture, if you plug r equals 0, you get the metamorphic locus. Um, so as you see here, it's a theorem, and here it's a conjecture. Uh, the reason is that we actually know more about the neuromorphic locus than about the, the double ramification cycle. So, as I said, the double ramification cycle is defined by some construction with virtual fundamental classes, so it's not very explicit. It is actually possible to define the neuromorphic locus also using some non explicit construction, and then I can transform this conjecture into a theorem. But that's a little bit of a pity because we actually have a much better knowledge of this cycle. We would like to know that we would like to, to show that plugging r equals zero, we get exactly the explicit sum that we know in this case. And this is still open. So more precisely, there are two alternative definitions of this meromorphic locus. For one of them, we can prove a theorem, and the other one gives an explicit expression. And we don't know that they're we don't know that they're equal. It's a, <coughs> an intermediate status. Okay, and for A, uh, there is actually a new problem because if you remember, for A, there was this extra feature that allowed uh, allowed us to go from codimension G to codimension G minus one. And it's not easy to uh, express this feature for S. So for L, there was, I don't know if it's, it's probably, it's probably, it has probably already disappeared. For, for L, there was this simple, this simple fact that H1CL, there was, there's a, there's a surjective map from H1CL to C. But there is no such map, if I write S here, there is no such map any longer. So I have to do something to use this map in terms of S. And there is a special construction to do that that is called, called witness class, witness R spin class. So in this case, we take witness R spin class, which is exactly, so as I'm saying, it's exactly the construction that allows you to reduce the degree from G to G minus 1 using this, uh, on, on this space of R roots. The Witten's R spin, R spin plus WG A1 AM. Uh, we take its push forward, 